Assalamu alaikum. Have you ever given advice to someone in private with wisdom and kindness, but it seems that you're almost always met with a variety of prepackaged slogans? Have you ever wondered why this impulsive behavior just keeps growing? This is what I personally call the Muslim convenience card. This whole process happened gradually. When the first generation Muslims were told something is wrong or haram, their reaction was, haram is haram. The reaction of the second generation was, I guess it's haram, but it should have been said nicely. And the reaction of the third generation is, who are you to say it's haram? This sounds exactly like our first Muslim convenience card, which is, who are you to judge? Number two, sinners blaming sinners for sinning different. Number three, Worry about yourself, number four. You don't know my struggles, number five. Are you the Haram police? And number six, which is the most infamous of all, you don't know what's in my heart. So where did we get these standard replies from? Well, they permeate our culture in so many levels and we took them and ran with them without reserve. So the question is for us Muslims, do these cards work for us? Let's take a look. We have two categories, postmodernism or subjective morality on one hand and Islam or objective morality on the other. If you're hearing this word for the first time, this is how Professor William V. Dunning defines postmodernism. And I quote, a worldview that emphasizes the existence of different worldviews and concepts of reality rather than one correct or true one, unquote. Now I can understand how using these cards under postmodernism is acceptable because truth here is relative and so no one can judge the other. At the end of the day, it remains a personal choice or preference. So there's no such thing as absolute right or wrong. Now under Islam, things are the complete opposite. For example, when someone says it's haram to drink alcohol or eat pork, a Muslim can pull out the who are you to judge card or you don't know what's in my heart card. Why? Because in Islam, it is absolutely wrong to do any of these things. So what we're doing is we're borrowing slogans that are not rooted in either the Quran or Sunnah, and we're trying to make them fit under Islam, and this is precisely why things are mixed up. Let's take this even a step further. Hijab under a postmodern mindset is oppression. Under a Muslim mindset, it's modesty. Revelation under this category is Fairy tale under this category, it's truth. A man's protective jealousy or ghayra under a postmodern mindset, it's an insecurity. Under a Muslim mindset, it's chivalry. Rights and obligations between both sexes under this category is discrimination. Under this category, it's justice. Enjoying good and forbidden evil under the postmodern mindset is being judgmental. Under a Muslim mindset, it's called a concern. Commands and prohibitions under a postmodern mindset, they're viewed as an infringement on one's liberties. Under the Muslim mindset, they're viewed as an assurance to one's well-being. As you can see, these definitions are quite stark and it's for this reason that knowing how to properly define terms is probably the trickiest thing facing us Muslims today. It's evident that Islam and enjoying good and forbidding evil are inextricably linked. In the Quran, in Surah Ali Imran, verse 110, Allah says, You are the best nation produced for mankind. You enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. In Surah Tawbah, verse 71, Allah says, The believing men and believing women are allies of one another. They enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. So no, Islam is not about looking for each other's faults, but it's also not about pulling out these convenience cards whenever someone admonishes us. In fact, not accepting admonition from one another comes with dire consequences. Allah tells us in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 78, Cursed were those who disbelieved among the children of Israel by the tongue of David and of Jesus, the son of Mary. That was because they disobeyed and transgressed. They would not forbid one another from the wrongs that they committed. Surely evil is what they had been doing. You see here, the abandonment of enjoining good and forbidden bad results in the curse of Allah. And it's for this, we should help one another by letting go of these cards for good. If you're still reluctant, then consider watching the next video titled, Why Muslim Convenience Cards Don't Work. 
You give someone nasiha or you simply say something is haram and it's downhill from there. Who are you to judge? We're all sinners. Are you the haram police? Only God can judge me. You don't know what's in my heart. Why are you being negative? Sinners blaming sinners for sin and different? You don't know my struggles. Why are you being judgmental? You're better because your sin is in private. Worry about yourself. We gotta talk. Assalamu alaikum. Who are you to judge? Today this word registers with many people as A, you're better than them, or B, you're looking for their faults. But this is a rather narrow understanding of the word judge, because by definition it simply means to form an opinion or conclusion, and this can go both ways. It can be in the form of praise or criticism. Praise would be, you did a great job, or you look great, but we react to praise very different than we do to criticism. When is the last time you praised someone and they said, who are you to judge? Probably never, right? This is because we like it as it feeds into our ego. Now, on the other hand, when we're criticized, things get personal, and our ego immediately feels threatened, so it rushes to defend us at any cost. We're all sinners, true, but not all sinners are the same. The Prophet upon whom be peace told us, every son of Adam sins, and the best of those who sin are those who repent. You see, some of us are proud, some of us are quarrelsome, some of us are shameful, and some of us are sardonic. In addition, this implies we should first become sinless before giving nasihat to others. And we all know this is just impossible. You don't know what's in my heart. If we mean by this that we have a good heart, then this becomes a kind of teskia that we're told to stay away from. So do not claim yourselves to be pure. He is most known of who fears him. This also suggests that having a good heart somehow exempts us from certain religious duties. See, the do's and don'ts in Islam are for those with good hearts, bad hearts, soft hearts, hard hearts, healthy hearts, ill hearts. If you have a beaten heart, you got to do your part. You're better because your sin is in private? This might surprise some of us, but yes. To this the Prophet upon whom be peace said, All of my ummah will be pardoned except for those who expose their sins. The most dangerous way this transpires today is by sharing our sins all over social media. Unlike private sins, this is open disobedience, it lacks shame, it's a form of promoting the sin, and it has a ripple effect. Someone starts and others follow suit. With this said, this should not be understood as a free pass to sin in private. Worry about yourself. It's enough to say here that Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, One of the worst sins is when a man says to his brother, Fear Allah, and he replies, Worry about yourself. Here are four reasons we should let go of these cards. Number one, using them does not feed our iman, but instead our ego. Number two, these slogans are not found in the Quran or the Sunnah. Number three, sinning is one thing, but not accepting criticism only makes things worse. Number four, Islam has been practiced for centuries, but we never heard of such slogans as we do today. So, who has the right not to be criticized or questioned? Not me and not you. This is an exclusive right that belongs only to Allah. He's not questioned about what he does, but they will be questioned.